Hello, Endeavor here. So we're back with the next edition of Morgoth and Endeavor's classic movie reviews. Today we're looking at a movie. Don't know if you consider it classic or not. It came out in 2004, but it is classic for me because it's a movie from my childhood. And it's one that has a lot of really great themes to get into. So that's why I wanted to choose this one for the, the stream. So what we're going to be looking at is The Incredibles. I don't think I need to do a plot summary for The Incredibles because I think pretty much everyone knows what the movie's about. Most people have seen it. It's about a family of superheroes, a family with superpowers. The mother and father were superheroes in the past, but their work has become illegal and they're living in 1960s America. Uh, and The Incredibles is actually my favorite film in the superhero genre, a genre that I'm really not that big of a fan of anymore. Uh, all these Marvel and DC films of the last decade, uh, they're extremely stale and they're really just made to make more sequels. The Incredibles is a standalone film and it came out only a few years before this, this format, which has really now made the genre really stale and they're just churning them out uh, every year. In comparison, The Incredibles is just really fresh looking back on it. It's a good family friendly film, though a little dark for the kids, but for, it's a little dark for a kid's movie, but still good for the kids nonetheless. It's a good standalone action film, and it has a lot of really fascinating themes to get into. It has a commentary on the family, egalitarianism, the American dream, nostalgia, maturity, libertarianism, technology, and a lot more. Overall, it's a delightful film and has some really healthy values. So I'm here with Morgoth. How are you doing tonight, Morgoth? I'm doing very well. It's a beautiful spring day here. Uh, and we're back once again to read way, way too much into a piece of pop culture and take it into, take the discussion into places where the director never wanted. But uh, <laughs> it's all it's all part of the other fun, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, what would you say about The Incredibles uh, to, to start with? I liked it. I remember. I remember because um, I'm a bit older than you, and so. I was actually reading Mark Stein's blog back when it came out or a little way after that. And he was praising it because it has back. So the, the main gist of it is that you've got this family with superpowers and the, the main sort of society um, doesn't cater to them and they've got to hide their power level. They've got to pretend they're just normal people and, and like do drudgery and work normal jobs the the, the 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 young boy is runs really quickly and he's not allowed to he, he has to pretend that he can't run that fast all this kind of thing and of course this was the at the, the kind of the, the millennial era when everybody in school was everybody was a special snowflake and I, like this is really the era that it came out in when that was just first beginning to come in to the, the the general culture where everybody would get awards and so the main kind of thing of it is, is like if everybody is special then nobody is special or what what happens how do you deal with people who are special and this kind of thing and and like there was this kind of center rightist approach as well, which is a lot more kind of gentle than what we're going to get into here. I think where where they were saying, well, yeah, th this is kind of a, a metaphor or something for for the current age where everybody where everybody has to be special, where everybody gets an award at school no matter how bad they are, no matter how even if you can barely run, you still get the same award as the person who won. And I think that's a, like the sort of center right reading into it, but there's a lot more going on with it. Yeah, so I guess we could start off with that, the theme of egalitarianism and of, uh, you know, there's a great line in the movie where uh, his, uh, Dash, uh, so Alasta woman, she, or Alasta girl rather, she says to her son, Dash, everyone is special in his own ways, to which he, he responds, that's a, that's a way of saying that no one is special. They have a few lines like that, or even the villain syndrome, uh, he, he, he says that, uh, when he ex explains his motivation to basically kill off all the superheroes and then give technology to everyone to make everyone super that once everyone is super, no one will be. Uh, so what you see in the world in the Incredibles is that it's starkly inegalitarian. There are simply some people who are super and some people who are not. And I mean, that, that uh, maybe that's not like a, an extreme right wing position, but it certainly is one that at least in, in by today's standards does cut across the grains of the zeitgeist because Pretty much, you're you're told today that everyone is great, everyone has potential. You know, the only reason that some people are successful and other people aren't is because of some kind of oppression or something like that. But in in, in the Incredibles, they they lay it pretty bare that yeah, there are some supers, there's some that aren't. It is inherent, and 
there really is no way that that you, that you can actually equalize that uh, safe or uh, just outright killing uh, killing everyone who is uh, is superior and then equalizing people by bringing all of society down. Um, but then it's also interesting to get into the to um, I mean, we, what, what we could we could either start with Mr. Incredible himself or the villain syndrome. Um, which one would you like to go for first? Well, syndrome, because then what, we're talking about how it's kind of subversive, but from the right. And it, it, like, it's a basic point, but syndrome is like a total nerd and a bit of a loser, but he's the bad guy. The standard Hollywood uh, approach to this would be to make the kind of the big blonde beast the bad guy and have the nerd who is a certain archetype um, which Hollywood likes for some reason, then they would they would load him up and he he would become the hero in the end. It's it's the nerd in Hollywood. They, they like it where like somebody like Ben Stiller, the the nerd gets the the girl in the end. And what the Incredible does is to flip that completely on its head and say that the nerd and the loser is actually a sociopath, um, and they have to, you have to watch out for them because they're they they've got no ethical values. They're scum, and they'll use they'll use machines to try and k kill off and uh, subvert and destroy the higher man. Yeah, I'd say that with the character of Syndrome, he is one of my favorite movie villains of all time. He is unreservedly evil, that's for sure. But it's not just for the sake of being evil, because with a lot of these super uh, super villains, they're just evil for the sake of being evil, and it's really it's really quite shallow. Uh, Syndrome is driven uh, to evil through envy and greed. In some ways, this may be con this may sound contradictory, but I don't really think it is. He's both an egalitarian and a narcissistic sociopath who's like completely self centered and individualist. Uh, and I, I think that does describe a lot of people on the left today. So um, he can't accept that there exists supers. So they refer to anyone who has a superpower in the movie as supers. And he can't accept that they exist and that they have a power that he can't possibly have. And he, when he was young, you see at the beginning of the movie, he's, he says he's Mr. Incredible's biggest fan. And he designs these rocket boots because, and he, because he wants to help Mr. Incredible. And Mr. Incredible just rejects him, tells him to go home. And that basically is what breaks him. He uh, he snaps and then he re so he rejects all of um, he he throws away all of his memorabilia from Mister Incredible and basically em embarks on a life that's si uh, similar to maybe some Ayn Randian uh, libertarian individualist tycoon. I haven't read any of Ayn Rand's novels, but it, that, that does I, what I said about Syndrome is that he kind of seems like if you gave the Seventeen-year-old Ann Cap, who has read Ayn Rand, if you gave him a billion dollars to live out his fantasies, you'd probably get someone like Syndrome. And basically, what he he has this huge delusion of grandeur, and what he does with his uh ra with his ravenous uh, or ra ravenously, uh, sorry, what he does with his massive amounts of wealth, which he's able to accumulate, he basically uses that to embark on his own narcissistic fantasies. Um, and, and, and that's kind of, the, that's kind of the, uh, the just of him as a villain. You could, you could see it like he's, he's like Bill Gates or some Silicon Valley nerd who they, they, they've got this technology, but they're completely soulless and stupid and narcissistic. So, you, you know, you, you can have somebody who, who like comes out with like a, a writes, let's say somebody writes a blog post and they've got some really deep and profound ideas about the state of the modern world and why it is the way it is. But then you'll have some retarded, like kind of uh, Silicon Valley nerd ban it. Like he, he's buying, he's, he's like silencing the higher man um, through because he's able to do it because he's got the technology. But he probably doesn't really understand what it is that he is banning. It doesn't matter. So you get this kind of nihilistic, like grinding down. Yeah, and what he actually does is he goes around, he goes around actually killing all the superheroes. So what he does in the film is he invites them to his island. Like he has he has his own private island with this huge base. I mean, you know that that's like uh, I mean I haven't read Atlas Shrugged, but you know I've played Bioshock. It's kind of like the the world that they created in Bioshock. Um, and he invites them there just to kill them off, and then he wants to eventually sell his uh, he wants to sell his inventions to make everyone equal. You know, one thing about Syndrome is that you, you you see, and they put a lot of subtle hints into this, that he has, he's very low character. 
So like he's not only just like narcissistic and and uh, selfish, he's also really clumsy. Like there's the scene where uh, he's where he first encounters Mr. Incredible as Syndrome, and uh, they even poke they even poke some fun at the the superhero genre that he's monologuing about how he's sold all these weapons and now he's he's above Mr. Incredible through his his technology and his uh, and, and you know his his skills in that regard, and then Mr. Incredible throws a brick at him. Uh, because he's he caught him monologuing, so he's just he can't help himself but to just monologue about how great he is, and then <laughs> he even like prepares this spiel for Mister Incredible, and he ends up throwing him by mistake across the entire island. So he's really just kind of clumsy, um, and you know, oh yes, go ahead. He, he's he's different as well to the apart from the nerd thing. Like if you look at like the standard Hollywood uh, villains. I mean, I watched the last uh, Avengers thing last night as well because I got off because I, I, I rewatched this and took some notes and then I, I watched, I caught up with the last Avengers film where, where I thought it was so boring. But even then, like at least Thanos like is like a great villain. And then you've got like the Joker or Bane and all of these great villains. And and they, they're kind of over men in their own right. That they, are, they do have a hero, heroic thing to them. But this syndrome's got none of that. Like he really is just a little prick with a lot of machines and a lot of gadgets. Like he's got he's got no kind of sort of nihilistic philosophy like the Joker has, or or any or like this the ethical standards of being or nothing. He's just a pure twat. Yeah, and what's interesting is because we'll compare him in contrast to Mister Incredible, but his desire to be super, to be a hero, is not really for out of a genuine desire to improve the society around him. It's all about a delusion of grandeur. It's all about spectacle for him. So he, his plot is to literally design a robot to terrorize people so that he can be the one to defeat the robot. And then everyone will think he's a hero. And, you know, you even see this at the beginning, like he doesn't, uh, he, what he, what he, the reason he wants to help Mr. Incredible, it's not because he actually wants to make people's lives better. It's because he wants to get in on the fame. So it's all just, uh, all of his motivation is kind of derived from this, delusion of grandeur that he has and he doesn't in, at all embody any kind of heroic virtues because you know i think that one thing that the film also also gets into is that being a hero um it requires more than just physical strength i mean syndrome doesn't have physical strength but he also certainly doesn't have any of the heroic virtues that someone like mr incredible would have no not at all i mean mr incredible is in every way like a higher man um, there's a good scene because another another you'll notice that just like syndrome, you've also got his boss, and so part of this is that Mister Incredible, the 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 supers, the superheroes get retired and they've got to get normie jobs, and you see like Miss, there's these scenes where Mister Incredible is like shoved inside like his car is ridiculously small so you see like his big bulging muscles sitting inside of his car like he can barely it's just like he's wearing the car and he's going off to sit in the, like this gray cubicle in an office and he's got this tiny little man up to his kneecaps who barks at him and tells him all about how their their machines and the cog uh, they're all cogs in this machine and somebody's being robbed outside and you can see the boss just doesn't care. And, and I think this is where you begin to sort of peel the layers back and see that it's actually more subversive and there's more going on. Like There's a deeper commentary on, on like modernity or post-modernity, which we'll get into later, than just the sort of winning medals at the races type thing. Yeah, so Mr. Incredible as a character, he's kind of the America, the... American 1960s family man. You know, he's a very wholesome character, uh, you know, but he, he does have a few flaws of, of his own. So, you know, in, in the 40s, what's, what's really interesting is the contrast between the intro of the movie and uh, the, and then the, the bulk of the movie. The, the first few scenes take place in 1947. So this is the glory days, as they refer to them, when the heroes were allowed to heroes, when they were going around fighting crime and Mr. Incredible was on top of the world. One thing that's really interesting is like the very first scene in the movie, the interview that they're doing with uh, Mr. Incredible, Elastigirl, and Frozo. Um, what you actually see is that the, the the things that they say in this interview, that later would be completely reversed. So Mr. Incredible, he says, you know, it's exhausting. I don't, I don't want to be super all the time. I kind of wish someone else would pick up the slack every now and then. And then he expresses a, a desire to settle down and have a family at some point. 
Whereas Alasta woman uh, in the forties, she's kind of this high energy, somewhat feminist, but not like in a, a not, not like in a vicious and uh, uh, spiteful manner, really kind of just full of young, just a young woman full of energy. She's saying, slow down. What do you mean? Slow down. I'm at the top of my game game. I'm not letting the men uh, save the, save the world. The, the women need to get in the action too. And um, what you see later is uh, uh, in contrast, that role completely reverses because after the jump, after the time jump, so once, uh, you know, Mr. Incredible marries Elastigirl in 1947, after the time jump to 15 years later, uh, she's become a lot more mature. She's now the mature mother, while as Mr. Incredible, he's the one that's kind of longing for the glory days. And, you know, a lot of his character flaws, I want to get into the theme of nostalgia a bit later, but a lot of his character flaws kind of do, um, do, do derive from the nostalgia that he has for the old days that, um, I mean, he is a good man. He is someone who does want to genuinely make people's lives better. But for him, it also is a lot of it also is spectacle for him, too. Um, yeah, but, I mean, yeah. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, Elasta, uh, almost every time you see Elasta girl in like the first half of the movie, she's always got a vacuum cleaner. She's always doing housework. And then Mr. Incredible is the one that's been. Uh, so he, he's the one that's longing for the past. He's the one that thinks, I, I, like, I need more than this. So again, you, you get like a kind of tr traditionalist trope in there. Something that I, I thought was interesting as well. Somebody, um, a, a, an old friend of the, the movement, let's say, say, is working on a blog, and he sent me a, a passage. He's actually done some work on this. He, he thinks it's uh, interesting. And I, I thought uh, this. There's a quite a bit that he's in his notes, and he, he sent me it. And he said, um, just on the, the the topic of the 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 boss and the, the job. And he says he likens the company to an enormous clock. So these are these notes that have been sent by somebody. An enormous clock which only works if all the little cogs uh, mesh together. The Olympian Adonis, shunned by the modern public, must withhold his divine strength and contort himself into the shape of a cog that can properly regurgitate the correct procedural actions to assist the running of an insurance corporation. Not only must he constrain his strength, but also his morality and will to help those in need. We're supposed to help our people, he says. So I think this is an important point that it's not just that he, um, Mr. Incredible has been constrained in a physical sense that he can't go out and uh, test his strength and test his metal in the world. But what's happened to him is that he's all like what goes with that, what's gone hand in hand with that is the problem that he he can't really live up to the moral values that he has either. They, they go hand in hand. The higher man's uh, uh, physical power and morality go hand in hand together. And the, the responsibility that he has to help people, that's been taken away. Yeah, and I do think that his, his desire to reach his full potential, that is perfectly... I think admirable from a masculine perspective, but it also does, you know, it, it also does, you know, drive him to some bad decisions as you see throughout the first, throughout the first two acts of the film. You know, I think with his character arc, uh, it's kind of like a rematuring because, you know, at the beginning of the movie, when he's at the top of his game, you know, he, he is, he's someone who is, uh, you know, a virtuous man. He is doing a public service. He's making the society's part of better. But at the same time, he also kind of realizes that uh, it is a responsibility that he has, and you know he does also kind of long for a, a few of the a few of the other things like like the, a family, which I want to get into later. That they are this is the only superhero film I've ever seen where they have this, the heroes actually have children. Um, but you know, I feel I, I feel like you know him being taken out of that role, him uh, kind of being forced into the office job, his nostalgia for the for the old days is a uh, it. it it's understandable in some respects, but it's also in some respects immature. So, you know, him uh, going off into like to stop a robber um, while, while him and Froza are supposed to be bowling or him having like all these posters on his wall of the glory days, uh, you know, his old suit hanging on his wall and spending hours in his den just staring at them. Uh, it is pretty, it is like pretty immature and kind of him, his character arc is that he eventually needs to re, uh, not only, you know, re-enter the role as a hero, not only become someone who can uh, reach his full potential in a physical sense, but he also is someone that really needs to regain his heroic virtues. 
Yeah, it's true. And there's a funny, th th this is something that I wanted to get into. And, and I've made some notes on this because it does, it links to the nostalgia, but like the Incredibles itself is, is retro futurist. Um, and we'll get into that later. But even on the, the nostalgia front, I mean, it is this beautiful picture of this idealized suburban America. Now, one of the things, one of the arguments that I see in, in, in sort of, let's say, Richard Spencer's corner of the right, and, and you get people on Twitter, and um, I, I wanted to dig into this a little bit. So you'll get people on Twitter, and they will post, like, advertisements from barbecues uh, from the 1950s, and and they'll they'll post them with this like longing nostalgic past. Now the funny thing about this is that like they, they so the critique that comes out of the the sort of Spencerite circles here, like they they are forever like sort of tearing down these trad posters, and and what they're actually saying is is they, like in a way they're agreeing with Mister Incredible because what they're saying is like this idealization of like suburban America, it still is just suburban America. It still is just slogging away for 50 hours a week in an insurance company with some little little nerd screaming orders at you. Like this is actually, is this really the idealized past? And I, now the thing is, there's, there's an element of this where you've got to be careful because there's certain demographic changes which have happened. And then you've also got, as the, the radio heads said in their song, like everything's in its right place. Like the, it's the, like it's literally the, uh, in this case, the 2.4 kids, um, everybody's, you know, everybody's got their rules. Everybody knows who and what they are and where they belong. Well, you know, that's kind of the theme of the movie, but I mean, so Mr. Incredible is kind of trying to become an overman. And you'll see that in that corner of the right, they are like big on niche. And they, they will see this as being this slow this slow sapping of, of the European spirit being locked in these horrible nine to five jobs. So when when you then pull out the like the the fifties adverts, or, you know the, the trad stuff, that they it, it, you can see where that criticism comes from because it's saying like you can't idealize the nineteen fifties past. Like what it, it's like an advertisement of a woman standing next to a washing machine. The mass production it, it, and the, the kind of the materialism is set in. It's baked into the cake even there. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, because you know I think the movie in some ways it. It has a lot of positive things to say about the American dream, but also it, it can be seen as a critique of the in the same in other respects too. Because, like you mentioned, uh, you know he might have a beautiful house, uh, three kids, a beautiful family in the suburbs, and you know I think any uh, any young guy could would dream of such a thing today. But even then, when you compare, uh, you know where you you can kind of think of that as the beginning of neoliberalism. You kind of think of that as the beginning of the soul rot that. Uh, has been burning for the last couple of decades, you know, like with Mr. Incredible sitting in the in the cubicle uh, in the uh, the depressing office where everyone um, where everyone has the same, exact same cubicle. It has one of those awful ceilings which are made of tiles. I don't know what those things are called, but you, everyone knows what they look like. Um, and it's what you kind of have it is is the uh, you have the hero, you have the Superman, the Hercule the Herculean figure forced into an office job. He's now just a cog in the machine which is grinding out this kind of uh upcoming materialistic society you know um with uh oh one, one second um yeah so so i think that in some ways it, it it kind of is saying that that this uh idealized past you know there were good elements to it but at the same time it it, it is uh it kind of is the beginning of the end of uh, it kind of is a, a beginning of the decline to where we are today. You know, I think it's fitting that the film starts off in 1947 and then the time jump goes to 1962 because, um, I mean, that's the last time that I could think about any, like anyone that American society could really consider to be a hero. I'm thinking along the lines of someone like maybe General Patton or uh, Douglas MacArthur. But I mean, when you think of since then, like who are some American heroes? I mean, maybe Neil Armstrong is the only one I can really think of. But uh, I think you had made a video about this a couple of years ago about how American society is now a society without heroes. And, uh, you know, this is kind of the era that that came about. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it literally is like that. From from it was when the Iranian when it was it wasn't that far. It was just a year ago when they killed that uh, general Soleimani or something in in Iran, and there was this huge outpouring of grief uh, in Iran, and and the, it was kind of rumored that the secret services or somebody in, in in Iran was saying, well, if we reciprocated if we then look at america and we look to take out one of their national heroes like who who is it like is it spongebob square pants or, or like who, who is it that we target and and then people under my video were all saying well probably clint eastwood so 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 like like an actor Whereas in in uh, back in like the real world, um, it it'll be a military commander. But if you want to do that in America, this national folk hero, then there's not really much of it there. There's not really anything to get. At. And and the reason for that is, in many ways, the the sort of suburban uh, consumerist materialism which seeped into America after World War Two, especially. Yeah, and you even see that in the scene where it's between the time jumps, so it's explaining why uh, the heroes had to go into hiding and quit hero work. They even have a, an image of them t uh, tearing down a statue of Mr. Incredible and uh, a few other heroes. So, you know, these people were these people were considered to be like heroic in the same respect that someone like Hercules or Achilles would have been a this mythical figure in ancient Greece, uh, and that's kind of just being torn, torn down. And what's interesting also is that. The movie, uh, the, the reason that they have to be put into hiding, it's uh, bureaucracy, really. The, 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 what they say, explain in the movie is that the federal government, the new in postmodern America, where everything has to be regulated, everything, it, there's all these laws, and um, you know, the, the, the state is just encroaching upon everything. Uh, what you end up with is that the federal government has to pick up the bill for the liability that of having these heroes and having them fulfill a, pub, a public service. And the reason that they go, uh, they have, they're forced out underground is because it's costing the taxpayers too much money that, you know, somebody with that kind of superhero um, might, someone with that, with that much power is a problem to the system because they're simply just too expensive for a system that is really just based on consumption. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, I was talking to somebody uh, earlier uh, on telegram and he, he was going on about how they they end up having to like stop dash the young lad the the little boy who can run like at a thousand miles an hour and they have to like put a cap on it and, and they ask him to come second in the races and th this is the problem that you'll see popping up in i mean watchmen is a much darker version of this actually um and much more political as well but the, what they're saying is that you if what we're talking about is the overman. The overman has to hide his strength. And what I was saying to somebody on Telegram earlier when we had a little back and forth was that from, from a, the perspective of a Nietzsche or, or a Julius Evola, they, they would view that as being absolutely appalling and that the supers have the super the righteous position of the supers in society is indeed to win every single race and lord it over humanity like gods like that, that's that's that would be that's how somebody like jonathan bowden that would be the outcome so then bob would be like the god emperor of america or something like this and, and all of the petty little bureaucrats and all of the pen pushers would just have to suck it up and know their place in the hierarchy, which would be nigh on at the bottom of it. And so um, this would be like the overman of Nietzsche, but you get to the problem. So I, I wanted to read this out, doing my very best here. And uh, this is a quote from Nietzsche himself. And he says, alas, there comes a time when man will no longer give birth to any star. Alas, there comes the time of the most despicable man who can no longer despise himself. Lo, I show you the last man. What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? So asks the last man and blinks. The earth has become small and on it hops the last man who makes everything small. His species is ineradicable as the flea. The last man lives longest. <laughs> we have discovered happiness, say the last man, and they blink. They have left the regions where it is hard to live for they need warmth. One still loves one's neighbor and rubs against him, for one needs warmth. So like Nietzsche's got absolutely 
nothing but contempt for this idea where everybody has to fit in and sit, sit snug with their toaster in their suburban uh, like house and go to their cubicle job. Like it, 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 you can see by the language he used, it makes him feel sick. That, that that the last man should be pinned down and and like entombed the way Bob is uh, in in this uh, in the Incredibles. Yeah, there's a great scene when Bob and Helen are arguing after he had just come back from uh, from saving the people from the burning building. Um, and one thing that she's angry at him because she says, "Oh, you don't want to go to your son's graduation," and he says, "Well, they're just he's not it's, he's not graduating. He's just going from the fourth grade to the fifth grade." And uh, he remarks, they're finding more and more ways to celebrate mediocrity. But when someone's really great, um, and he replies, like, you know, we should let him play sports. And she says, well, you know why that we can't do that. And he uh, he screams because he'd be great. So, yeah, what you really see is that the uh, the wider society really does prevent anyone from ever actually reaching that ever actually reaching that higher ideal. But I think that it's important to contrast this with uh, the Randian uh, super, uh, Superman, the Randy and uh, business tycoon, because I think that it's completely different. I do think what the, what the film does a very good job at contrasting these two, because one of them is someone who actually, you know, that maybe I haven't read Evola, but, um, the, the, the kind of person that he's talking about, I haven't read Nietzsche either, but I can imagine like the kind of person that they're talking about. It also comes along with virtue. It also comes along with a responsibility to the wider society. While the Randy and ANCAP, uh, business tycoon kind of like the syndrome character it's just pure individualism it's all all of that is just for his own self gratification so i think that it's important to note that with the with the supers there does actually come uh there, there does actually come responsibility with with that it, they do actually need to be the leaders of society they do actually need to make this the wider society that they are they have power over they need to make that better whereas the uh the randian one uh he's it's it's you know, he's just a, he's really just a uh, parasite because it's all for his own, his own uh, self delusions. Yeah. And it, he's in, in a way they are, they are like the sort of the overman, but within and like trapped within a materialist paradigm. So that expression of will uh, just comes with getting more money and having a bigger house and and sitting up on top of a say a skyscraper somewhere in New York, like lording it over over the world with shifting money around. Or or another way in in a kind of warped way would be like the, the Silicon Valley tech. It's so in, in in a in a kind of warped and twisted way that's kind of like what Bill Gates is. Bill Gates like forces his will on the world just through the fact that he he made a lot of money. So th this is kind of like what it is in a purely materialist paradigm. So it always, somebody's going to force their will on you. So you may as well make it somebody with somebody that is outside of materialism and with it, with some sort of metaphysical vision. Yeah. And I guess like the problem with, because the, th the theme of technology, the problem is that technology allows the inferior to become superior. It allows, it allows uh, inferior men to rule over superior men because you know, you, what you'd see is in the past, maybe there would have been some, uh, some ruler who would have ruled by the sword. Well, what Bill Gates is going to do is, you know, he, he, he's not going to beat you in a fight. What he's going to do is make it so that when you go to the grocery store, you can't buy uh, you can't buy any food with your credit card because you didn't take the vaccine or you you did a racism on the internet or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just to sort of st uh, switch gears a bit, one thing that I did bring up, wanted to bring up just in terms of the filmmaking was the, the, the airplane scene. I just thought the whole thing was absolutely brilliantly done um, where basically Elastic Girl has got the kids on board of an airplane. They're heading towards the island um, it's all it's it's it reminded me more of like James Bond than an actual superhero movie with the soundtrack as well. Like I said on I read on Wikipedia, um, it, it was basically the soundtrack was based on um Her Majesty's Secret Service, and then Syndrome's got like an island in the middle of nowhere with a like a monorail thing on it, and he's got loads of goons wearing overalls, so it's much more like a James Bond movie than a superhero one. But the, the scene that I love the most was when he starts to fire rockets at the, at the family and Mr. Incredible's bound up. And you can see it, I thought it was really powerful because you can see he can't do anything about it. And he knows that they're trying to blow his family out of the sky. And he actually thinks like that's what they're going to do. Oh, and, yeah. 
they, they do they do blow the plane up and that she's trying to get the girl uh to use like a force field thing but she can't do it she's not that uh she hasn't found out how to do that yet and eventually they, they do get sick and i thought that this is for what for what it is this is really well done oh yeah i think that this scene is really deep and uh, i must say it's probably one of the darkest scenes i've ever seen in a kid's movie so um mr incredible is under the impression because the the, the missile strikes the plane and blows it up. Uh, they're able, his, his family is able to survive, but he does believe that his family has just been killed. Um, what's a, a, such a fascinating scene after that though, is uh, when Mr. Incredible, then he's bound up and then he just reaches for uh, syndrome, but then he catches Mirage instead. And he says to syndrome, Re release me or I'll crush her. It'll be easy. Like breaking a toothpick. Um, first of all, like, for a kids movie like goddamn when i was nine years old and i saw that i thought holy hell uh you know the superhero is about to like you know literally rip someone uh, in two uh an innocent person uh but and then says well of course syndrome calls his, his bluff he, he says show me do it and uh mr incredible doesn't have it in, doesn't have it in, in him and he lets mirage go to which syndrome replies that he's weak um what's so fascinating about this scene is that this really i think uh undermines the entire superhero genre in a good way because um what you're what you're used to seeing in these superhero movies is a superhero who is uncorruptibly good against a villain who's uh, cartoonishly evil so you know you never think that like batman is going to like kill an innocent person to you know get revenge on the joker or something like that you know you're never going to see spider-man uh you know uh, use an innocent person to get get to get, defeat Doc Ock or something like that. But what you, what this scene shows is that Mr. Incredible is morally fallible. So he is capable as, as good of a man as he is, as, as you know, he is a hero. He's someone who actually does have good intentions, but as good as he is, he is someone that is capable of committing evil. And, you know, a lot of these movies do really miss the mark. They just have the bad guy and the good guy. And, and that's basically just it. But, you know, it really, it, it, it speaks to, I think, a lot more accurate um, description of evil, that evil is not, um, there, there isn't good men and bad men. Evil is kind of a temptation that, um, that, every, that everyone suffers from and that even the best of people, it still is within them. There is the famous uh, Solzhenitsyn quote, which I've, I've said a few times on this channel. And that's, that is what it reminded me of. But uh, it's, 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 really, it's really important because it does humanize Mr. Incredible in some ways that he still goes through the temptations of good and evil, just like Syndrome. And that's something that you don't see from other superhero movies. I thought that was really well done. Yeah, I mean, Batman plays around with that a little bit in uh, Nolan's Nolan's trilogy. By and large, they are all like white and white. They, you know, they, I mean, the the, the postmodernist aspect comes in where you you, you think, are they going to fall? And and where 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 they lose their way, where they don't know anymore. They they it'll often happen where they don't actually know which what's right and what's wrong, which is a, a like a. a this particular theme but mr incredible is put to the test and then he comes through it as well luckily because then that woman like releases him and saves him so it has this knock-on effect where her goodness also comes out because of his act of uh, heroism you know yeah i thought there was a good line that she said uh I, i'm paraphrasing but it was something like valuing human life is not weakness and disregarding it is not strength yeah, because I mean, with with syndrome, his his idea of strength and of and of power is just being completely individualistic. It's just having no uh, no um, sympathy for anyone in any way, shape, or form. But you know, with with the hero like Mister Incredible, uh, he actually he actually has that temptation. So he you know he he wants to do good. He uh, but even then he can be tempted into evil, and maybe in a bit a bit less of an extreme sense. It is also interesting to look at his motivation throughout the first two acts of the movie because many of that, you know, you argue. I argue that in the, throughout the course of the movie, he really he really matures back into the hero role because, you know, when, in the scenes where he's him and Frozo are driving around trying to solve petty crimes or where he's accepting this this um this task to go out to this island, a lot of that is really selfish on his part. I mean, like you know, in the scenes where Elasta Woman is arguing with him. I mean, I can understand that he is a man, and as a man, he he seeks his uh, he seeks uh, self actualization. He wants to be the best that he can be. But at the same time, it does actually seem really petty, and I kind of actually side with her in some of the 
scenes where she says, you know, you're you're jeopardizing our family, you're jeopardizing your children by doing this, and that that ought, really ought to be his highest priority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get you get back to that problem again with, with, with the two, the sort of where you, you get the whole problem where you find out that like a, a far right take on this isn't necessarily all about like bringing up the kids and living in suburbia, like we touched on earlier. I wanted to, to like read this thing because you were talking about uh, syndrome and the technology problem. And another sort of quote that I was sent from uh, this gentleman's upcoming blog, I think it is, he has no inborn superpowers, but rather produces a sad stage facsimile of heroism through technology. This is literally an automated simulation of heroism that is counterfeit True greatness is recognized to be elusive and ir irreplicable. It, uh, irreplaceable. I think. It cannot be synthesized. His technology surpasses him and he loses control over it. Although that was a, a, an interesting touch as well, where Syndrome's grand master plan um, of his technology, his technology gets away from him and he can no longer control it. And it's the superheroes who who have to come back and sort it out. So it, it, like the overman has to return to mop up the mess. Yeah, it's like a thin, a thin veneer of heroism. And I think you can even see that today with, um, you know, the elites that are ruling over us. A lot of them are not very virtuous people. And it kind of shows, I mean, through the art that they that were, is forced upon us, and, and just like the various, uh, and, and just kind of the way that they go about it themselves, the way that they really show, um, you know, the image that we're given by our so-called betters today, um, you do really see that they're a lot more incompetent than someone who would have naturally fulfilled that role in the past. You know, um, you can just look at America, for example. Today, I mean, America has basically become, American politics in places like the Capitol Hill have basically become uh, Jerry Springer. Like, there's no respect for each other. There's... Um, it's really just turning into this big uh, into this big joke. You know, you can see Joe Biden like stumbling on the stairs, and it, really, what you do see, and then you know, that's not to mention the the, the SJWs who have just been wafted into positions of power, people who really are just mediocrities at best, losers at uh, losers at worst, uh, kind of being given this this huge um, uh, artificial status, and it really does show. I don't think that you can fake virtue. I don't think that you can fake leadership. Because uh, I, I do think that, that you know, the, the true nature of it will always shine through regardless of the technology. Yeah. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg would be like a perfect sort of avatar in the real world of syndrome. And you think, wait, what, what just to sort of touch on something from our circles, if you, if you look at somebody like uh, Gerard Taylor, and he, he's like stuck his neck out and he's speaking truth. He's a very polite, very well-spoken gentleman. And then, and you think like, what right does, like what right does Mark Zuckerberg have to ban and censor somebody like that? Who's clearly a better person than he is, you know? And, and this, this is, this is the technology. This is the technology problem coming in where it, it gives, it gives the underman superpowers. Yeah, and I also I also think that there probably is a bunch of people out there today that in a previous time would have actually been uh, the overman that who actually would have you know risen to the top of the hierarchy, and they're really just being kept out of it. I think we probably have um, you know thousands of young men running around who you know are just, have just kind of just been had that opportunity stolen from them, and uh, you know I mean you just have to look at who actually is in the elite and. Uh, you, you definitely know that in any other at any other time, any time that's not this uh, postmodern technocratic society, these people would have no chance. I mean, what use would some uh, overweight, transgendered Afro feminist have in any society before the last, you know, decade or so when, you know, any kind of like any society where people actually had to survive or, you know, there actually wasn't su such an abundance of technology, uh, this person would be completely useless. But, you know, in some ways, like, uh, one of the big ironies is that these are the people that actually kind of uphold the system because Zuck, someone like Zuckerberg, he'll he'll just relentlessly defend uh, the, the the reigning uh, orthodoxy, or he'll just relentlessly defend the reigning uh, power structure because under any natural one, I don't think someone like him would rise to the top. No, you can see. I mean, you can see in in the system and the way it functions who does rise to the top. You can see who gets banned from YouTube, and then who sits there uh, getting super chats uh, for thousands and thousands of dollars uh, a week. 
Like you can see that it's completely dysgenic and that the freaks and the weirdos get a leg up because they, they you know, you can think of some big names on, on left wing YouTube who make a killing from, from and only because the, 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 they are facilitated by the technology and by the mentality, the spirit of it, which exists in it. Yeah, and I, you, we got into this a bit in the Dr. Gervago review. It's that uh, they'll have that argument that, well, we should, equality is a good thing. Why should there be uh, inequality? And then, uh, you know, with, with you see this with Dr. Gervago and you also see it maybe maybe to less of an extent in The Incredibles, but you certainly see it in our modern in our modern society is that the actual, uh, the, the actual outcome of that is something that is uh, demonic. And that is something that's just revolting. And, th and that is the result of the kind of the race to the bottom, really. I mean, and, and not only that, like talking about uh, like uh, removing like syndromes pr plot to uh, to kill all the supers so that everyone can be equal. Uh, and speaking of that, I mean, today they've really taken that to the next extreme where they're saying things like we need to abolish certain uh, higher levels of higher education because there's not enough non-whites that can get into these levels. So, you know, because or like another example in the military, they're saying that because women can't uh, fulf can't actually perform at this high of a level, we need to drop the, all the standards for everyone. So it, it really is a society that has embraced that kind of uh, race to the bottom. Yeah, something else that I wanted to touch on was the the the, the, the uh, sort of a postmodern thing about uh, The Incredibles. So The, the Incredibles was, uh, it came out in 2004 and I was thinking about this, that, it, so if you if you we are now 17 years after the the incredibles came out and you can see that as a form the pixar thing like it really it really hasn't really progressed at all maybe it's got a little bit more the like sjw themes in there it could be that the cgi kind of graphics are a little bit more uh, high definition or something but except for that, like almost nothing has changed whatsoever. And, and you can see it in the general culture as well. Like, but then if you go, so that's 17 years. And if you go back uh, 17 years before 2004, then you're in 1987. And it seems like just a complete paradigm shift. If you, you, you then you can even go through, I was looking at what movies came out in uh, 1987 and it was things like uh, the lost boys robocop predator and i know they're not like kids movies like this is but still the the shift is gigantic and then that's just to, like that's just 1987 you've then got the like up until 1990 that you've then got all of the things that happened throughout the 90s and then even the early 2000s and then you get the, the so they, there's this, it seems like so much happened and the culture changed in so many different ways. And then you get to 2004 to 2021 and it's like almost nothing has happened. It's it's like, um, well, like well, we are literally in the end of history. And I thought like, how, so how did that come about? Uh, what's going on here? And part of it you can act is actually explained in um, the 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 Incredibles itself because they're constantly doing this thing. All of the Pixar movies do this as well. And it, back in two thousand and four, it was quite novel, but the, it's become like just just kind of so tedious since. And it's where if you look at say the Incredibles, there you've got tropes in there which are sort of cannibalizing previous ideas and previous forms. So you've got the music, which sounds like uh, James Bond. It's about superhero movies. So they're going to talk about different tropes within the superhero uh, genre. And then it's, it's then on top of all of that, you've also got this retro futurist feel. So it's like how people in the 1950s were thinking about how the future were gonna, was going to be. That's kind of the look and aesthetic of it all. And what you'll find about all of this is that it's backwards looking and nostalgic and it isn't any kind of, of new vision. And all of these Pixar things do this. And in fact, it's now sort of spread itself all across the post 2000s era. So it becomes very, very difficult for any new form to emerge because what you get is this like reference to a reference to a reference. And you can see this in something like The Sopranos as well. So The Sopranos is a gangster movie where, you know, it's kind of like at the end of the mob, 
It's but in wait, well, not a movie, but a series. And in the series, they are referencing the Godfather and uh, uh, say Scarface and Goodfellas. But even Scarface was a remake of something which came out in like 1940 or something. So what what we've ended up in culturally is where all we can do is look back on the past. Um, th I mean, this is this is like. This is a, actually a nightmare for the left to deal with because they're supposed to be forward looking as well. Yeah, and they even kind of try to poke uh, they, they poke a few um, holes into the superhero genre. Like they have they have a few really uh, clever jokes in there. Like there's the running joke about capes uh, where Mr. Incredible is, wants Edna to design him a new suit and he says he wants a cape and she says no capes because they go over all these superheroes who have died because their capes have like gotten caught in a jet turbine or uh, they've gotten caught in a rocket or something like that. And I mean, it, it is pretty, I thought it was pretty clever because if you actually think of someone go, running around and actually fighting a bunch of bad guys, that cape would be pretty inconvenient for you. You trip over it all the time. Uh, they also have another running joke in there about monologues. So in one of the scenes where uh, Frozo and Mr. Incredible are, uh, are reminiscing on the old times, Frozo is talking about how a villain one time had him on a platter. He was, he had, he was, was just about to kill him, but then he started monologuing and then he got away. And they even have Frozo do that later in the film. But I find like, you know, when, like you mentioned, a lot of those were looking kind of back on the superhero genre as it had existed prior to that. But there hasn't really been anything, no, nothing really new has developed since then. So like it's, it is like a genre, which I mentioned at the beginning, is just so stale today. I, I can't stand these, these movies like, uh, I don't even know which ones they're making these days. These uh, incredible, no, um, uh, Avengers, uh, DC, what, whatever it is, whatever they're coming out with now. Uh, it's just so stale. It's just like we have to just keep repeating the same form over and over again because you know we, we're and uh, we're just stuck in this like loop of not having anything, uh, not not being able to actually create anything new. Yeah, the I mean, this this is actually something that left lefty intellectuals like Mark Fisher, especially who I've read and watched his speeches. And um, Derrida did stuff on this, which he called hauntology. But even even the way, and you can see in the Incredibles that even the way we think about the future is now dated. So if you think of say um, synthwave or cyberpunk or these things, and then the retrofuturism of the Incredibles itself, it's it's where now even to get a vision of the future, we have to go back to the past. Now, why this has came about is, um, like, the, you, say, Mark Fisher blames neoliberalism for this, that it take it, it brings everybody to live just in the moment and just in the present. Um, I think that plays a factor, but I think the, the problem is sort of civilizational exhaustion. But what I will say is that there's... there's um, there's, there's like opportunity here because it means somebody like somebody has to impose some kind of vision on the future. We or unless we just go on like this forever, and I think people are just going to end up going mad. I mean, they, they, they I was watching a, a music video by uh, Tame Impala, who aren't like old. Oh, they're still going hip. One of those high high pitched voice indie bands. And the, the 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 video of it was like people. It was yeah. There was some hot babes in it on a beach, but what I, what I, what stuck out to me was the way the, the video was like this grainy footage. So it looked like somebody's home, like a homemade video from people on holiday in 1992. And so again, you get this like nostalgic, backward-looking vision. And you can watch all of these pop just like. Watch, watch some pop videos. Just turn them, turn the sound off on YouTube, so you don't have to hear the awful music. But you can see like, so many of these bands that came after two thousands have got this retro uh, like look. So you look at the video and you think, was this video made like in nineteen ninety or in, in the eighties? And it's it's because they don't know how to conceptualize the present. They and they certainly don't have any way um, to look into the future. And, and it's just interesting to me that like uh, the Incredibles was was kind of fresh at the time because you hadn't heard people referencing pop culture as much, like you were saying about the capes. Um, you've got like the sort of James Bond type soundtrack, but then it went on, and you you got more and more of these things, and they were always looking back on. They were kind of cannibalizing the cultural forms of the past. 
But now you, you get like 20 years later and it's like, Jesus Christ, is anything new ever going to happen? The most famous example would be the complete disaster of the Star Wars. As, uh, I mean, there's a million there's a million YouTube videos about how the sequels were crap, but there's not very many like saying, well, how would, how would you have made them? Yeah, uh, because we I mean one theme that I also want to talk about was nostalgia itself. I was planning a video on this, but one thing is that when you look at not only the the, the pop culture that's released today, but at the entire society, everything is just so old. Like you, have, like someone like Nancy Pelosi, she's in her eighties. Uh, Joe Biden is nearing eighty. Uh, all these leaders, they're people who are like far beyond the age that in any pastime they they would still be uh, politically active. Uh, and then I thought of this like that Indiana Jones, they're going to make another Indiana Jones movie next year where Harrison Ford at the time of release, he's going to be uh, near 80 years old. You know, not only is he older than Sean Connery was when the the third one came out in 1989, when he was when Sean Connery was supposed to be the, the silly old man running around. He's 20 years older than that. I mean, and it's just like they're just, uh, you know, I just thought of that as, uh, as some, something that's so... Uh, emblematic of both the culture and the wider society is that uh, you're just wheeling out this 80 year old man from some former uh, to, to just, you know, live off of the nostalgia because you're unable to create anything new. So you're just going to end up with more and more X-Men stuff, except now a few uh, more of them are going to be black and more of them are going to be LGBT or something like that. But in terms of the Incredibles, they actually do touch on nostalgia because I do think that it is a movie that, uh, I mean, I can understand Mr. Incredible's nostalgia in the first uh, two acts of the movie, but it is one that kind of does portray nostalgia as something that is immature, that you do actually have to move on eventually because um, if you're just sitting in your office, you know, yearning for the old days, then you are really just waste. You are really just wasting away. Yeah, I mean, the moral of the story is like, if I, like it can't go on like this, and somebody will sort of step forward and. Uh, move things on oh i mean i saw it saying this is a spangler type thing yeah it is um where it, it you you look into the abyss there's nothing more happening all you can do i mean as usual like spangler's like really pessimistic and and he's like people go like sort of it's like a huge scrap heap of dead civilizational forms and cultural forms and people are kind of picking bits out because nothing you know <laughs> like like rats on a scrap heap they're looking for morsels of things to make give them meaning again looking back in the past so they can find some little comfort blanket of meaning in the like the just complete nihilism of the present. So, uh, like uh, as usual, happy take. But I mean, even just just to lighten things up a bit, like even the Star Wars movies was like just such shit. I can understand why all the bug men like get angry. But if you want to, you know how I would have made those. I would never have. The, if if you have to make a, a movie after Return of the Jedi, he has he has what he has what the Morgoth version of that would have been. I would have had it where the, the like the, the rebels, the normal humans who didn't have the force, that they were then exterminating children all over the anybody who had force that be like the, the force powers, they'd be getting exterminated by normal people because the normal people were terrified that all of that hell would they'd have to go through it again. So what they would do would be to say, well let's just exterminate anybody who has force powers. And of course you'd get a few people that would slip away and escape and like you know they'd have to impose their will and uh, put these like kind of normies in their place and lord it over them in a brand new empire but lord but do it properly this time so that's kind of how i would have approached doing the star wars sequels but what do you get you just got a rehash of the original yeah and you know i think that one thing with uh and maybe this might tie into uh why the genre is so stale and why they can't create anything new i mentioned this a bit br uh, briefly a bit earlier but i wanted to get into this one thing you see is that the superhero genre is extremely anti-family. So, for example, almost every superhero wasn't raised by their parents fully. So, you know, Batman's kid, uh, parents died when he was like 12 or something. Spider-Man's parents died when he was young. Uh, Superman didn't even have, he had different parents somewhere else. I can't think of a single one who actually had like the the traditional upbringing of a, you know, a, a mother and a father. And then all these characters, none of them have children. Batman doesn't, Spider-Man doesn't, Superman doesn't, the X-Men don't. And like, I know maybe someone can point to some like obscure comic out there and well say Spider-Man did have one, but in the main canon though, 
the one that's in the public consciousness. None of these heroes actually have children. Um, and, you know, I do wonder, is this kind of a genre that is just anti-fertile? Is it one that really uh, is just in the here and now and can't really bring anything into the future? And I think that, you know, that, that it's, it's just, I think the, the family theme in The Incredibles is so interesting in that regard, because in some respects, you could argue that, you know, maybe someone like uh, Bob, he's the overman, he's an exception, he should be out there fighting crime. And maybe, you know, if a family is too... Uh, is too burdensome for him. Maybe he shouldn't have one, but that's the exception. I mean, you could make that argument, but at the same time, you know, I do feel that with the hero, with the, with the overman, you want them to have some kind of stake in the future. You, I mean, I think one of the biggest problems with our elites today, you look at all these European politicians, none of them have any kids. Um, you, you would want that, that, that overman, the person who actually has the power to lord it over people. You want that, some, that person to have a stake in posterity in the future of society. And it was really interesting how they put that into the. They, it's really interesting how they put that into the film because we should also probably get into the character of Alaska Woman because with her, I mean, she's one who she's one who actually matures. I think a lot faster. You know, you see her at the beginning. She does. She's not like the family is the last thing that's on her mind. But once she actually becomes a mother, then uh, that's really where her. Um, that, that's really where her priorities lie. So, what would you say about the the theme of this actually being a superhero movie that the that the the heroes actually have children. Well, yeah, that's that's the main part. But it, I mean, it also adds to the sort of the, the, like this the suburban the suburban setting as well, and it, it also kind of dispels some of the aura around the the like the, the, the superhero. Like there the, the, there is a kind of deconstructionist thing going on there from from the perspective of of the heroic because. You know, you, you'll see like uh, Bob like sitting around watching TV. Like that, that is what it adds to. So, it, like, what would it be like if if you were to have like say Bat Batman and he's gonna try and like solve the, the new like Joker riddle? Uh, the, the the Joker's escaped from prison and he's got like a hostage. He's got a train full of people of hostages. And then like, does Batman then have to drop the kids off at school and? help little Batman with his homework before he can don the cave and head off. It does kind of take away the magic. But, you know, I think it's also difficult in terms of, like, narrative because it means they're always going to have, like, a super weak spot. If you notice with Superman, um, who is, like, almost invincible, Lo Lois Lane only really exists in the Superman universe to be kidnapped and dangled from a building. Because we, because otherwise, like, that's that's where the drama is. What do you, unless you use kryptonite, which, you know, they do that again and again and again, you, you need a way to beat Superman, but you can't kill him. So you, they've had to invent this tender spot, which is Lois, so she can be like uh, kidnapped and, and uh, disappeared. That you can get him that way, but if if you're going to have too much of that, it will be it would be difficult in narrative terms. Yeah, I, I do. I do find the scene pretty funny where there's a fam. They're having a family argument, and then uh, Mr. Incredible lifts up the table, and the last woman has her arms like twisted around the children. It's pretty. I mean, it's pretty funny. It is certainly a subversion of the archetype because you never think of like you know Spider Man webbing his son into the chair so that he does the ho his homework or something like that. But you know, I, I think like uh, on a more serious note though, um, when you think of a lot of traditional heroes and a lot of uh, folklore, and even you know maybe just like you could think of someone like European monarchs from the past, posterity was always very important for them. It was never enough to just be the overman. They always wanted something to be left behind, behind for the future. I don't know where I heard this, but um, you, you'll you hear a lot of times in ancient Greek mythology or something that uh, you will have many sons and they'll, and they will carry on your uh, legacy or something like that. So I think that, you know, that's one thing that really is missing from the uh the entire genre is the kind of the I, the concept of posterity now you know incredibles doesn't really uh, it doesn't really have uh, that you know dash is necessarily going to become the next uh, over overlord that takes that takes up uh the you know if if um once once mr incredible dies as the god emperor of america dash becomes the new god emperor they don't really get into that but it is something that's interesting to to think about that the traditional hero always had kind of a um he, he always had some kind of stake in the future. He always wanted to carry on his legacy after he died. And they, they'll 
I mean, especially in the comic book world, for certain reasons we'll, we won't touch on, but you'll notice that there's there's no kind of Christianity or Christian uh, morality in there at all. They, you know, they, they don't go to they don't go to church. I mean, Superman we may well go to a different religious building if you look at it, like where he comes from and stuff. But um, there's you have to think what is the sort of ethics that they go by. And whereas in Batman's case, that is leaning towards a sort of uh, Nietzschean type thing. Mainly, um, they're just a bunch of liberals. Uh, the, the superheroes are really just, they're really just more better at being liberal than anybody else. Which is why, you know, is, is it the case, like, in, in everybody goes on about now, uh, like, say, the SJWs are taking over my superhero movies. Um, with their, their messaging, what what can you actually argue against? What is it that they stand for, if not just liberalism, uh, in in the sense that everybody should just be able to do whatever the hell they want? There's nothing in the, the ethical code of, uh, of Superman or Batman to prevent any of that happening. It was just taken as a sort of a priori that it would be the cultural standards of, say, uh, the 40s or the 50s, and then eventually the 80s. But slowly they they all do kind of change and and forcibly as well so they end up in the end like the greatest enemies would be like um the superheroes like they they can, they will be standing for global homo yeah i always thought of that with the avengers it's always like that they're just uh, their, their goal is to basically just prevent anything from coming into the global homo system and, and interrupting it. So, you know, we, we got to save New York because then, you know, the GDP will go down in America next year. If this district of New York is destroyed, we're going to lose this many consumer units. And then also, I think you've pointed out in a video in the past that you'll just see like mass destruction in a lot of these, uh, in these hero movies. It's like the society that they're trying to save is pretty darn worthless because um, you just see like mass death. You'll see like these buildings being knocked down and you think how many thousands of people are dying in this and this, I mean, uh, and I mean, and there's really very little that you actually care about in regards to the society that they're supposedly saving. Yeah, it was the it was a video that I did about the one of the the last Godzilla movie, which I thought was actually okay, um, but I noticed that. We've, it didn't used to be like this either. Um, it didn't, this level of destruction. Now, part of that is because they can do it with a special effect. But if you go back to, say, um, the Christopher Reeve uh, Superman films of the 80s, again, it, 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 he'd stop the missile from, there's one where Lex Luthor uh, tries to fire a, a missile into the fault line of uh, like there's the Sandra Andreas fault line to create like a huge earthquake in America or something. And and he saves it. But it's again they've had to dump Lois there. Lois is like in it being crushed. And then he spins around the world to go back in time. But you can see that it, it, it comes back to being one individual which is it's like she she is the, the problem here, losing her. But the idea of showing like uh, Metropolis being leveled like Man of Steel did would just be unthinkable because it's just it's just raw carnage and death. But this now is what you see all of the time. And so in the in the the Godzilla movie that I did a video on, like it literally was that. It was it was just if if you like think, well, hang on a minute, because a skyscraper's falling down like dominoes here. And you're thinking like there must be millions of people dying inside of that. And it gets back to the sort of the 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 mass what what the last man or as I call it in the video the mass man, where what globalization does uh, it, and it, it when you, the the technocratic view of people in the modern world is that we are just these units we are just numbers we're, we're nothing, and so when it comes to sort of wiping us out in these these uh, wiping out whole cities like Godzilla casually done as well and you see it in all of these movies now i mean in in the in the avengers one like thanos wipes out half of all the creatures in the universe or something and it's people have said this is predictive programming that the the elites in hollywood are preparing us for something that, but what what it is i think is is this re, where, when you've got a mass society um, that then, yeah, it is the case where you can just be taken out by the millions because you've just been reduced to ants. 
And what I said in the the video I did on Godzilla was that, if, like, again, like this, so this is how I would do that one. I was saying before how I'd remake Star Wars. In in that Godzilla movie, I would have that like, all of the, the big monsters are going to descend on a little village somewhere in Japan. But you spent some time in Japan, like you saw the kids going to school, you saw like an old lady feeding the ducks and this kind of thing. A couple of little storylines in there. And then you'd at least have a stake in it. You'd understand what was under threat. But when you're in just a mass society of, of kind of herd like dumb cattle consumers, who gives a shit? There's always another million on the other side of the world. There's always another billion consumers to be imported from Africa or somewhere. It doesn't make a blind bit of difference. Yeah, and I, I, you also can compare that to say like the ancient Greek myths, whereas like they're going off to to fight in Troy, and like these guys must have come from like their. Uh, I mean, the, the Homeric poems were before the polis, but you know they they were going off. They would have lived in these like tiny villages. You know, the men in ancient Greece, for example heroism was fighting for their polis which had like you know maybe three or four thousand people like it's a lot smaller scale but uh and i was actually thinking about doing a video about this too but you know it, it seems like there's there, that 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 kind of way of life seems like so much more meaningful it seems so much more grand so like you know a a uh a, a greek polis of only you know three or four thousand people uh but you know it has some farms it has some nice uh you know old uh, greek architecture and maybe you know some uh, philosophers and stuff like that uh that being like crushed by a bunch of persians that's uh, a lot more horrifying than uh all of like new york city with like eight million people just being wiped out because they're actually you know it's not just the um it's not just the human biomass that's being protected it's actually uh something a lot more spiritual than that yeah i mean when um christopher nolan's uh batman series batman truly which is great like the, the it was it was criticized for being too violent and having too many people die and i think like even in the joker one the death toll is about 12 people or something and nobody and then you get to like where half of the universe is 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 being taken out or or like just whole cities are disappearing and so the problem is it it's a problem when it's more personal you know, it's it, but when it becomes own per, and I think this is also when everybody complains about the ruling elite, and it's that's because how they see us, they see us like these ants, um, and they, they run the world like a computer system. So the, how the, how life actually is on a personal level is is alien to them. Bill Gates doesn't know what it's like to like go for a walk with his dog uh, down a bustling street, you know, and see those masks everywhere. He, they're, they're just like an alien cast looking down on all of these ants. Yeah. So uh, if anyone would like to ask any questions to Morgoth or I, you can post them in Entropy. The link's down below. I think that one, the last thing I probably want, we should probably say a few words about is the sequel. So um, I, I saw the sequel only last week. I watched it in preparation for this, uh, for this um, review of the first one. Uh, I will say that it's clearly an inferior film. It does seem like a poor attempt to cash in on the first movie, and it's basically the first movie without any of the charm, uh, any of the deep themes of the original, and really the the leftist themes are really kind of on the nose with the second one. I have a feeling that what they said to Brad Bird, the, um, the execs at Disney, they probably didn't like the reactionary themes of the first one and told them, you got to cram in some SJW politics into this one, and I kind of think that's what we got with the second film. Uh, so what did you think about that one? Yeah, I thought the same. What, what, the only thing that I'd... I thought it was boring, to be honest. But well, what I uh, what I did like about it was that you got more of the like the retro futurism in it. The, the you got this monorail going around the city, which which looks really great. And I, I just it, it's like as I was saying before, I just think it's interesting that this is how people in the 50s thought, say, the 90s would be like, where you'd have these super clean streets with a monorail, which was free to use. <laughs> and, then, and, and, you, and you think, well, where did it go wrong? Like, that's an interesting subject for another time. But yeah, I mean, the main the main villain was crap as well. The, the, the superheroes were reduced to just these zombies. 
and the main villain was this woman, and she was like a sort of millennial SJW like archetype type thing. I I, I just thought it was crap. I, I just didn't like it at all. I thought it like it was much more interesting to look at and think about the 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 sort of the, looking into the future from the perspective of the past and the future that never happened and, and why. But like the, he, you're never gonna get an answer. To, uh, I need something like that on this. Yeah, a few things that I noticed was like the, the in the second one, uh, it, it also ruined Elasta Woman's uh, character or Elasta Girl rather, Elasta Girl's character arc because um, in the first one she kind of matures from being the you know young energetic uh, kind of feminist young woman who has a family and then becomes you know the responsible mother and you know in the first one she never she never becomes like meek or um, like submissive she's still like strong willed but you know I mean her priorities are in a different place. But this one it completely reverses that where now she is like some uh, she, she just reminds me of, you know, one of these uh, for like in, this childless cat ladies in her 40s, like talking about like girl power or something like that. And it, it, the writing is really terrible in the second one. Like there's this one scene where uh, the the brother of the the giant company says, well, my sister designed this thing. And then they actually have a last woman like look at her and say, you designed this and then nod. It's like the, they're literally saying guys, you're supposed to be impressed that a woman did this. And it's just so on the nose. It's really awful. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's funny because I was saying before, like not almost nothing changed. And if you want to see what kind of cultural changes we've had in the 17 years or like the, yeah, what, what would it be like 14 years or 15 years between the first one and the second one, the, the changes are very subtle because we're culturally stagnant. But one one change that I noticed straight away was the difference between the girl, the the violet she's called the daughter. In the first one, she's like this kind of awkward, introverted, goth archetype that you had in the like the late nineties, the early two thousands, and you'll notice that in the, the 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 sequel, which is like just a couple of years old, she's like this like really attitude like sort of mouthpiece who's like really opinionated and constantly belittling her dad and things like that. Whereas the, the and I thought, what, what happened to the goth? What happened to the goth? What happened to the introverted, like white goth girl who had a Pearl Jam t-shirt on? And is this, is this like horror? Is this mouthpiece what they turned into? It seems to be so. So that's one like cultural change we've had anyway. Yeah, uh, and I think I, th I forgot to mention this, but one thing that's interesting about the children in the first movie is that their powers are actually very reflective of the of a lot of the moods and attitudes of people in that age, kind of the maturing process. So Dash is a 10 year old boy and his power is that he can run really fast. You know, he's young and full of energy. This is a big handful uh, of a boy, um, but, you know, one who's like and full of joy and everything, whereas Violet's kind of the awkward teenager full of anxiety so her power is that she can either disappear or put force fields around her you know because that's a, you know and many teenagers especially in the 2000s you know i was in the i was in high school in the 2000s in the early 2010s yeah it's certainly it's certainly a feeling that you get at times uh but um yeah in the second one they, they completely they completely throw that away another thing that you noticed was it, it kind of goes back to that to not being able to advance past uh, any certain point in history is that there, um, th there's a scene where, well, not another scene, a subplot where they're the um, media mogul who is trying to normalize superheroes by getting them to come out as superheroes to raise public opinion of them. I mean, it's a complete, it's definitely an allegory for homosexuality about uh, normalizing that. The, the uh, and the media mogul, by the way, I mean, <laughs> this character is, he definitely, if he was a person in real life, he'd be of a very interesting early life background. But, um, they even they even have these characters like these superheroes that are going to come out as superheroes. Like they have a last woman there, and she's like, "Oh, you're so amazing! You're out as a hero, and we we're, we're so inspired." And all the character models they all look gay too, so uh, it's it's really the on the nose. But what I wanted to say was that, um, I mean, if they had done this in say two thousand and four. When, uh, when you know, they were just trying to implement all this, like, uh, I think the gay marriage was the big issue back then. But they're trying to do this in 20, I think the movie came out in 2018. Like, this is when we already had things like transgender children and drag queen story hours. It's just, you know, they're just pounding away at the exact same meta narratives. And there's really just nowhere they can go with them. Yeah, I mean, in, in, the, in the first one, 
like Alaska girl, the, his wife, there's this like running joke where so he's going out and moonlighting and solving little crimes because he, he wants to be still doing the hero stuff. And th there's this like running joke. So he, get, he gets himself like a sports car, which I think um, Syndrome gets for him. And but before before it's revealed that he's really evil, uh, but the, the gist of it is he's like he's got fit again, he's back in shape, he's got a sports car, and this is like a trope where the, his wife would be like he's going through a midlife crisis and he's actually got a like a, a girl like a woman on the side and he's having an affair behind my back, and if, they they kind of play around it a little bit where it's like well is she talking about that or does she mean and she actually doesn't. She actually means, yeah, he's going off and in the middle of the night. And um, but she doesn't she doesn't think for a second that he's actually having an affair. The joke is revealed that she yeah, she thinks he's just going off and fighting crime uh, behind her back kind of thing. So that's you can see like back back then, at least that was a sort of cultural trope, the midlife crisis thing. Now it doesn't happen because you don't have a midlife crisis because you're got you're permanently in the state of a 20-year-old. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like you see, the the midlife thing is that is you know the thirty eight year old bug man buying those like plastic crap. What do they call pops or something like that? Of I don't know Jack Sparrow or something like that. It's really quite pathetic. They never have the midlife life crisis because they never actually mature. And you know, I think that one thing I liked about the first Incredibles is that it was a film about maturing as well. You know, both of them mature as they both them mature as uh, both Elastigirl and Mister Incredible and mature as people. Um, but he even even saw it in the second one. The other thing that I noticed about it was that it had some like very strong conformist messages. So they put uh, they put a line into the mouth of the villain where uh, she says like uh, maybe you know a lot of the critiques we've been saying about like postmodernism and about how everything's kind of fake. People aren't living this authentic life. They're consumed by technology. They put that in the mouth of the villain in this movie, and it's almost like you know th the villain hates uh, this society, but that kind of critique of it is illegitimate. And it's kind of their way of propping up neoliberalism in the second one, where the first one actually is a pretty strong critique of it. And there's another like offline that that they have the cop saying to the um to like with the guy that they arrest, uh, always blaming the system. So it's, it, it almost like kind of not only is it a film that tries to really shoehorn a lot of the the oppression narratives from the past into it, it also is one that seems like very conformist for like neoliberalism. That's saying like, well, anyone who opposes this, they're the villain. So. Yeah, uh, I think it's pretty. It's pretty bland. It's pretty crap. I thought you'll you'll find that sometimes um, mainstream Hollywood will will pose questions that it can't answer within the li the liberal kind of paradigm. I was talking about the 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 Avengers in the first one. Like Thanos's sort of reasoning is that he need like basically life, not human life as well. All life is um, there's actually. I mean this. There's some funny things in in the Avengers, the, those two movies, and so Thanos is saying like it's unsustainable how we live now, and that we have to reduce the amount of creatures like eating things and consuming, and I'm gonna do it, and you're gonna hate me for it, but I'm gonna reduce the amount of living creatures in the galaxy by half. Fifty percent of everything will just be disappeared. And then he goes ahead and does it as well. And what he's saying, it's this like utilitarian argument where he's saying like the, the, the total amount of happiness will be worth it. Otherwise, what are gonna all end up like eating all the resources and then slowly like starving to death and having an e ecological collapse. So somebody has to come in and do something, and I'm it. I mean, this is all starting to sound very like very familiar, isn't it? But what <laughs> But somebody has to come in and protect us from consuming the planet. But then um, in, the, in the second one, they don't actually resolve that at all. So I'm thinking, I, I was thinking, well, okay, so either they're going to have to say that Thanos, because it is a problem. Uh, like he, he does make a very powerful argument that somebody needs to like, cull the numbers. And so they kind of present a very powerful argument. They steel man his argument in the first one. And I thought, well, if that's the case, then in at the end of the second one, the Avengers are going to have to concede that point and then have some kind of technocratic uh, system for to manage the entire uh, galaxy or at least the Earth. And they, they, even, they even have um, Captain America at one point says... Um, yeah, I just walked because now by now 50% of everything is gone on earth. It's five years later. 
And Captain America even says, I just wandered across the San Francisco Bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, and I saw like a pot of whales in the in the ocean. And he says things are great now because there's like uh, there's less pollution, there's fewer people around, like wildlife is making a comeback. And I thought, well, what, what is it? And then and then they, they go on to Iron Man and uh, he's had a he's got a little child by now. And he actually turns around and says, Would you like me to fix you some crickets on lettuce? And I thought, what the, what the hell is it? like is is it that the deep state? Like this is really strange, isn't it? I know it's like off on a tangent, but I thought this is this is really weird. Yeah, they're kind of like putting this stuff in where they're, they're giving us this climate change stuff that you know, when unless we start eating the bugs and living in the pods, then uh, we're gonna are gonna die off in t- ten years or something. But at any rate, they want to have their cake and eat it. So when when we don't have a resolution, we don't know how uh, how it's going to play out in in that fictional universe. Like what it is so is everybody just gonna you know? Uh, because they do fix the problem in the end, but then you're still left thinking, yeah, but Thanos was right. Like they are all of these, this dumb mass, or they are just going to eat through everything. What are you going to do about it? But they, to have them then form like a technocratic elite, which was uh, like you know, sterilizing people or telling everybody to eat corn, or what do they call it? Those layers up steaks or whatever they're called. 3D printed steaks or whatever they are. Like, no, because then, like, either way, they're going to be the bad guys as well. So you cannot have, couldn't have that either. So you're just left with nothing. <laughs> yeah. It's like they're prepping us for the future dystopia. Uh, I got one super chat from Gladius Maximus on Entropy. Great chat, gents. You two, Frody and Ty E are the heavyweight champs of film analysis in this sphere. Well, thank you for that donation. So I think uh, we've been going on for almost an hour and a half. Is there anything left you'd like to say about the film, Morgoth? No, not really. I mean, I think um, it's it's interesting to, especially with these Pixar things, I stopped watching them years ago, which is why I was like <laughs> hesitant when I had to uh, dig back into The Incredibles. But I'm happy I did because what I began to realize was just how sort of parasitic these, these Pixar things have become. Um, even back then, the writing was on the wall, on the good ones as well. But especially the Pixar things, it's it's just cannibalizing previous cultural forms. And this is one of the reasons why we don't get anything new. I mean, I've I've been reading the, the sort of the Warhammer 40k uh, novels just to, uh, and you can, it actually it's like a fresh breath of fresh air because you think, yeah, this is actually original and it's different. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the mainstream is not going to give you that. Yeah, I, I kind of think we're, that we probably aren't going to get any more good Pixar films like The Incredibles. I haven't seen many of the recent ones, but I did a video on Wall-E, and that's another one that's actually a pretty darn good critique of modernity and a, and a critique of neoliberalism. The, uh, the, the uh, just sort of the the final word is that even the this the 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 sort of the analysis of um the, the the critique that the incredibles has where he's in that cubicle this meaninglessness of, of uh, like this shit cubicle job working for the corporation I, I actually think that they wouldn't they would find they'd be uncomfortable with that now even because that that opens up a nasty can of worms for the the the, the neoliberal elite now yeah seeing seeing a guy who would have been Achilles in a past life, sitting in a cubicle with a little midget yelling at him about how they need to get the numbers <laughs> up. I mean, that's, yeah. pretty, that's pretty damning. So, you know, but what I think, though, is with a lot of these films, like they, they a lot of times, that I think with Incredibles, the guy who made it, he claims to be a centrist and he's rebuffed the right wing bias. And, I, you know, I honestly think that he is probably genuine in that. I think that he went out to make a, a good film. Yeah, and that's what he started with, and uh, it just ended up having a lot of uh, reactionary films, uh, a lot of reactionary themes, because uh, good art, obviously, um, good art often reflects truth. So, you know, it, it's it's something that resonates with people because it's saying something true about the world. Uh, and yeah, I think with I think with the second one, they said, okay, let's not go with this. We we have a message we want to push, and uh, that last one was kind of a bit dangerous. So, but anyway, well, I'd, I'd say about the first incredible film, it's. Um, a great film, great for kids, uh, family friendly, a bit dark in a few parts, but nothing that your you know nine or ten year olds can't handle. Uh, great action movie as well. It really has a great, uh, you know, has a lot of great action scenes, a great plot, kind of similar to James Bond, like you mentioned. And uh, it's one that 
really does have a good critique of the modern world. So, you know, if you're looking for something, uh, you know, and so if you, if you, if you're dying for something nostalgic, uh, don't be too nostalgic because that's unhealthy, but you know, don't go back and watch the next, uh, Hulk or, um, Thor or whatever it is they're coming out, watch the Incredibles because it's a lot more fresh. It's a lot more deep. It's a lot more original and it's just a lot better. So anyway, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. And we will be back next month on Morgoth's channel. Have you decided what we were going to do yet? Yeah, I was just going to go. I, um, I think, I, well, I did say we could do an 80s uh, action movie just to move it on from the, the animation. But I've recently uh, started on my Odyssey channel. I'm doing a little thing which I call the Morgcast. And I'm going to do that more, which will be sort of... Uh, podcast length monologues with me i've only got one up so far but i'm going to be doing more of them where it's stuff which is just a bit too spicy for youtube so i am also thinking that um we could pre-record it and um do one of spartacus which it, it's it doesn't sound that spicy um but when you dig into the history behind spartacus and the era that it was set in, it gets into some very spicy territory indeed. So um, that's it. Or it'll be a, um, something, something, uh, an action movie, which I've got in mind on, on, and I'll do that on the YouTube channel. So yeah. we'll oh, go ahead. Okay. So yeah, check that. Uh, keep an eye out for that for next month. And let us know, do you guys want us to do these pre-recorded? Because that might be a bit more convenient for us. Also, uh, would you like us to move over to Odyssey only? Because... There are some movies that we can't talk about on YouTube. Spartacus would be one of them because it's it base, it's very uh, spicy, the themes, when you look at the early life sections uh, behind that movie. Uh, so uh, let us know. Do you want us to stay on YouTube uh, as long as possible, or do you want us to maybe get an, uh, to a bit more of the spicy stuff on Odyssey? Do you want us to pre-record them? So anyway, keep an eye out for the next one, and uh, have a good night, everyone. Cheers, everyone.